Welcome back to another episode of Ancient Historia. Today we're going to be talking about a Tartarian king who was supposedly burnt at the stake by Charles V, the Emperor of Rome at the time. Before we begin, I'd like to say a big thank you to all the supporters, Patreon, YouTube, uh, Coffee Buyers, everybody, you guys are great. Thank you very much for helping. If you'd like to become one of the patrons or join the channel memberships, you will get access to my Discord server where I post all my research all day. So if that's something you're interested in, definitely get down and do that. We've also got some books in there, a lot of books actually. So if you're looking to research, we've already got quite an extensive library for you to get cracking on with. Anyway, our journey begins with this map from 1612 produced in Antwerp and it's called Tartaria Sieve Magni Shami Ragni Typus by Abraham Ortelius. Now, as you can probably tell, it's written in Latin, but fortunately for you, we have the translations just for people to have a quick look at before we get going. China down here, Tibet on the left, this is Cathay. We have a city down here called Tartaro. Obviously, Japan here on the right. This is showing America parts. This is California here, or Baja California, Sierra Nevada, etc. So, gives you an idea of where we are. This has Azareth and Argon. Looking like the Manchuria areas here. And up here, it talks about the Scythian Ocean, which it says has, according to Pliny, many islands and has sweet water. So obviously sweet water refers to fresh water, which does possibly fit in to what I was talking about in the Baju, the Gog Magog and the Late by Cal videos, the pole shift videos where I hypothesized there's a possibility that due to the size of Lake Baikal, which has in recent years had tsunamis and lost quite a bit of its water, so it was actually bigger at one point, we hypothesized that possibly they might have believed that it was the ocean rather than a lake, because it's huge. You wouldn't have been able to see the land on the other side. If that is the case, that would match, because of course it is the largest freshwater lake. As I said, that isn't something we're focusing on. So this is the map of Tartaria, or the kingdoms of the Great Sham. Now there is some interesting stuff that it talks about in the rest of this map that we won't go too much into today. We can see the map isn't fully lined up correctly here, with some bits being cut off, but I presume nothing important has been missed. But some examples being, we'll start with Tanga. Here the art of printing was invented thousands of years ago. It's something that didn't come to the West until, you know, 12, 13, 14 hundreds, depending on what you consider printing. Of course, we're talking about real printing. We talked about the Scythian Ocean. We have Azareth that says here the ten tribes retreated and changed from the Tartar or Tartar area to Scythia. Since then they are called Goths or Gothans, confirming God's highest glory, and here lies the splendid kingdom of Cathay. For Argon we have once there was in Asia a Christian kingdom known to Prester John, and D. Thomas founded it, this city, in this place, so that it was in contact with the Church of Rome and it was subjected to Rome through Prester John of Africa. Before it was defeated by the Goths, it was known as Crive Romove. Now, obviously, we know that Prester John is not of Africa. We think he's more likely to be of Russian descent. People have equated him to being one of the Ivans, so there's a big possibility there. Mongol history says that John was Uncham, who was the person that was warring with Genghis Khan from the north and that was subjugating his people before Genghis Khan overthrew him and married his daughter. There's many different stories to do with this. Then we have Mount Altay, or Altay, where all emperors of Tartaria are buried. Seems to have been described by Hathon the Armenian under the name of Belgian, the Belgian mountains. So this is Turkestan, which we talked about before, areas of independent Tartary. And just for reference, in case anyone was wondering what it meant down here, it actually says, This map contains the area of Tartaria, with the remaining part of East Asia to the Morning Ocean, subject to the Great Khan, whose might is bounded by the River Obi, Lake Cathay, the Volga, the Caspian Sea, the River Chesil, the mountains of Uson, the area of Tibet, the River Karamora, and the ocean. So that's just giving us some boundaries of where the Great Sham or the Great Khan lives. Underneath Japan, it gives us the information that the Isle of Japan, called Zipangri by Marco Polo of Venice, formerly called Kreis, which is interesting, 
as in Kreisa, like Christ, once attacked by the Great Khan in war, but without success. Now, onto the interesting bit that brought us all to this video. Tabor, or Tiber, center of the area of the Tartars, where once the holy books were destroyed or got lost, could be different translations there, but once where the holy scripture was destroyed or where the holy scripture was lost, yet they are united under one king who in 1540 first reached France and King Francisus, and later, at the initiative of Charles V, was burnt at the stake for his heresy because he had secretly endeavoured to convert Christian kings to the Jewish religion, about which he had spoken with Charles V. So that started the investigation into who was this Tartarian king from the centre of the Tartarian areas who was burnt at the stake in 1540 for supposedly enticing European kings, particularly King Francisus, to join the Jewish religion. So we started investigating who King Tabor could be. So we started off searching in the most obvious place, which was Google. And unfortunately, searching for King Tabor provided nothing but Ashley Daniel Tabor King, OBE, a British businessman which wasn't very useful for us. So I tried King Tiber, and unfortunately that just brought us to Attack on Titan, the anime about giants who eat humans and almost destroy the world. Adding the year 1540 to the search just provided us with more links back to the exact map and translation that we'd been talking about. We know that he first reached France supposedly in 1540, and that he was burnt at the stake for his heresy. Well, further searching provided a book called The Relations of the Most Famous Kingdoms and Commonwealths Throughout the World Discoursing of the Situations, Religions, Languages, Manners, Customs, Strengths, Greatness and Policies. Translated out the best Italian impression of Bosphorus. But yeah, so is this book from 1586 or 1540, 1617. So, so this is obviously when these guys were about. So I'm not sure exactly when this book came out. It provides us some information on Tartaria. And right at the bottom here, as part of these Tartarians inhabit cities and are called Moors, part live in the fields and mountains and are termed Baduin. So some of these people dwell in cities as the Cathayans, Bokars, and those of Samarkand. Others wander through the plains and are divided into hordes, being five in number as aforesaid. Now we've talked about this before, that the hordes actually comes from the Russian word for order, as in army, order, O-R-D-A, order, and that's where the word order in English comes from, because you have order in an army. So a horde is a bastardization of that word. Those Tartars who are fair situated from the residue and inhabit that remote Scythian promontory, which Pliny calleth Tabin, or Tabin, lying upon the fret of Anian, are also dispersed into diverse hordes, wandering up and down the country, and are in all manner of subject to the great sham of Cathay. Now, it's debatable whether Cathay and Catea are the same thing. It's possible that they're not and that they've been conflated, but that's a topic for another day. So for now, we're going to assume that it means Cathay is in C-A-T-H-A-Y, but it's very possible that it actually refers to Kara Kithe, which is basically Black Kathé, because the Kara is black, so you have the white and the black. So it could refer to the fact that this is Black Kathé, which is Kara Kithe, just like Kithe Lakus, which we now know or think to be Teleskoy Lake in South Russia, which would fit these kind of areas, because it is exactly where Tartaria would have been. Certain writers affirm that these hordes issued from those ten tribes of Israel, which were sent into captivity of Salmanasar king of Assyria, beyond the Caspian mountains. In remembrance whereof until this day, they retain the names of their tribes. That's important, so they will retain the names of their tribes, the title of Hebrews, and circumcision. In all other rites, they follow the fashions of the Tartarians. Some men likewise say that King Tabor came out of these parts to turn unto Judaism Francis, King of France, Charles V, and other Christian princes, and for his pains in the year 1540, by the commandment of the said Charles, was burnt to ashes at Mantua. So that's provided us a teensy bit more information that it took place 
at Mantua. So hopefully that can help us finding King Tabor. You'll also notice that Francis I, King Francisus, does have a rather unique look to him, and that could be quite possibly down to the fact that the Khazars, the Khazars became the Cathars in South France, and of course one of their princes in 1099 called Godfrey of Bouillon actually became the king of Jerusalem after one of the Crusades, and he is a Cathar, which obviously comes from Khazar, in the same way possibly that Cathay comes from Kanzay, so Khazars again, and the Kada Khazars. It's very possible that Francis I is a descendant of this same line of Cathar princes, which would make them Khazars, obviously like Khazar, Kazakhstan, Cossack, all coming from South Russia, aka Tartaria. This is an image of the original book that contained that stuff that I was just reading from, so we can actually see down here that Cathay is spelt with that C. So yeah, we can be pretty certain that that's referring to the same place. If you'd like to see this book, I will include the link in the description. So by adding in our 1540 and our Mantua, we have been provided with this. So this comes from Purchase's Pilgrimage, or Purchase's Pilgrims, our relations of the world and religions obscured in all ages and places, discovered from the creation unto this present in four parts. This is by Purchase, Samuel Purchase, and it's uh, part of a very large group of documents based on the Tartaria explorations that you can find online. So if you actually search for Purchase's Pilgrims, you'll get a decent book that comes with a lot of talk. Don't know how much of it you want to trust, that's up to you, that's what research is about. It's up to you to go and read it and make up your own mind. Now in this book we come down, we have the King of Tabor, or Tiber, in these parts is said to have come into France, to Francis the French King, about the year 1540, so I like that, about the year, and was after at Mantua by Charles the Emperor burned for secret solicitation of him and other Christian princes to Judaism. So, just reiterating what we heard on the map, really, but it is another source saying the same thing. Again, replacing Tibor with Tabor, but obviously having the 1540 to Mantua, it does give us a few more results that are much better than what we were getting before, because this is what the point is about this, by the way. The internet has this stuff, they try and suppress it, but it's still there. So if you have the right key terms, if it's there, you can find it. Their job is to, to hide it by, by making spelling mistakes or changing things, hiding things away or covering up, coming up with new things. So, like, for example, with this Tiber, it could be completely coincidental, but it's very convenient that a King Tibor has recently come out in an anime, and that will dominate all the search results for anything to do with Tiber. So, whether you want to believe that's a purpose or conspiracy or coincidental, it's up to you. Now, this document is just repeating what we saw before. Some men likewise say that King Tabor came out of these parts to turn onto Judaism, Francis, King of France, Charles V and other Christian princes, and for his pains in the year 1540, by the commandment of the said Charles, was burnt to ashes at Mantua. This one, in this country, is the wilderness or desert called Lop, from whence came King Tabor, whom Charles V burnt at Mantua 1540, for persuading the people to return to Judaism. And in this country groweth rhubarb, a herb of excellent nature, that the whole world is beholding to these barbarians for it, and as a sovereign help for many diseases. So there's another piece of information. It's saying that in this country is the wilderness or desert called Lop, and this is where the King Tabor came from. And according to Wikipedia, we still have the Lop Desert, or the Lop Depression is a desert extending from Kaula eastwards along the foot of the Kuruk Targ, meaning dry mountain, so there's Kuala or Kuala, and it's the second largest city in Xinjiang, China. So that moves eastwards to the former terminal Tarim Basin in the Xinjiang Urga Autonomous Region of China. So it's in the Urga region. So I wonder why the Urgas are receiving so much poor treatment in China today. Could it possibly be to do with the fact that they are descendants of Tartarians? A satellite image of the lop here, and unfortunately it doesn't include a decent map showing its position, but we do have the coordinates so we can have a peek on Google Earth. And that is where it gives us as our location for where this would have been. So does that match? Do we think that that makes sense? Obviously late by Cal over here. This is our China or Mongolia region over here. And obviously this is just Western China. So, what do you reckon to that? Is that possibly where this has come from? Or is that a renaming? 
We can see Mongolia, the Kazakhs over here, Uzbekistan, Tashkent. So, does this seem like the right location for where this Jewish king has come to Europe? Now, turning to Mantua stake burning to try and get some information on this, we get given this article straight away, 1532 at Haritz.com Jewish World. And this says that this day in Jewish history, 1532, a false messiah burns at the stake. Raised as a Catholic son of Conversus, Solomon Molko decided he was the Jewish messiah and opted to die for his beliefs rather than recant. On the JewishEncyclopedia.com we have 1531, the Murano Solomon Molko was burned publicly at the stake during the visit of Emperor Charles V. That matches, although the congregation received permission from Pope Clement VII in 1530 to build an Ashkenazic synagogue, the Duke did not confirm it until 1540. Now. 1531 appears to be the date here rather than 1532. Now, we know that it was about the year 1540, supposedly, that this man was burnt at the stake. So is Solomon Molko the guy we're looking for? So Solomon Molko, originally Diogo Pires, was a Portuguese Jewish mystic and messiah claimant. When he met with the Holy Emperor Charles V to urge the creation of a Jewish army, the emperor turned him over to the Inquisition and he was burnt at the stake. This guy was born in the Kingdom of Portugal, but he was killed 1532, 13th of December, age 32, burnt at the stake in Mantua. But this is where it becomes interesting. So nothing is known of Marco's family or even the exact date of his birth. He was born in Portugal sometime between September 1500 and August 1502, probably to Murano parents. His original name was Diogo Pires. He held the post of secretary to the High Court of Appeals of his native country. When the Jewish adventurer David Rubeni arrived in 1525 to negotiate with the king, ostensibly on a political mission from some of the ten lost tribes of Israel, Molko wished to join him, but was rejected. He then circumcised himself and was forced to emigrate. And it says, in company with David Rubeni, his mentor, he went in 1532 to Ratisbon, where the Emperor Charles V was holding a diet which in politics is a form of deliberative assembly. On this occasion, Molko carried a flag with the Hebrew word Maccabi, the four letters which signify an abbreviation for Exodus 1511, who among the mighty is like unto God. The three met for two hours, and while the exact content of the meeting was not recorded, letters written from the court at the time indicate Molko proposed the establishment of a joint Jewish-Christian army to fend off the emperor's foreign enemies and possibly to reconquer the Holy Land. The emperor had both Molko and Rubeni arrested and took them back to Italy. In Mantua, an ecclesiastical court sentenced Molko to death by fire. Molko was taken to the stake in November or December 1532. Jewish tradition lists the date as the 5th of Tevet 5293, but there are no records to confirm the date. It is claimed the emperor offered to pardon him on the condition that he returned to the Catholic Church, but Molko refused, asking for a martyr's death. His mentor, David Rubeni, was exiled to Spain, where he later died. So whilst this doesn't sound like a king of Tabor, perhaps we need to investigate his mentor, David Rubeni, who it says was supposedly sent on a political mission from some of the ten lost tribes of Israel. He also bears the name Rubeni, the tribe of Reuben, which as we read earlier, these people supposedly did carry down these names still. So this could possibly be our guy. Molko, before his death, became a master Talmudist and studied the Kabbalah with Joseph Titusak. He wandered as a preacher through Italy and Turkey and achieved a great reputation and suggested the Messianic Kingdom would come in 1535 or 1540. In 1529, he published a portion of his sermons under the title Derashot, a book that was later renamed Sefer Har Mefoar. Returning to Italy, he was opposed by prominent Jews, including Jacob Mantino Ben Samuel, who feared that he might cause unrest among the Jews. Now, it was interesting that he was given an audience before Pope Clement VII and gained his favour, as well as some of the Judophile cardinals at Rome. He warned the Pope to leave Rome, as the city would soon be flooded, and he sent a message to the King of Portugal, warning of an imminent earthquake. The occurrence of a deadly flood on October 8, 1530, and an earthquake in Lisbon on January 26, 1531, 
raised Molko's reputation among the religious and political authorities. You'll notice that Molko was supposedly a messiah claimant with it saying a dream Molko had in 1526 apparently led him to believe he was destined to be either the messiah Ben Yosef or his precursor, but in none of his writings or speeches did he ever explicitly state this or proclaim himself the messiah, so it could be a case of people trying to smear his name by saying he claimed to be the messiah. However, it is very coincidental that he was able to predict the occurrence of a flood in Rome and an earthquake in Lisbon. Is that possibly the real reason why he was burnt at the stake? Now on to David Rubeni. Obviously Rubeni being the tribe of Reuben, descendant as we talked about them before, keeping the names of the tribes. So David Rubeni was a Jewish political activist described by the Shengol Jewish Encyclopedia as half mystic, half adventurer. Although some scholars are reluctant to believe his claims to nobility, citing suspicions of fraud behind such claims, in spite of Rubeni's unrelenting efforts to make an alliance between Christians and Jews against Muslims, by the intermediation of the young King John of Portugal, in November of 1525, he was nevertheless given an audience with the King, accompanied with a letter of recommendation from Pope Clement VII. So Pope Clement VII had recommended this guy to go to Portugal, and this is where he met Solomon Molko. So Solomon Molko met him in Portugal and was like, I like this dude, I want to become a Jew like him. He actually said, no, you can't become a Jew. And Molko was like, I'm not having that, and he cut his own foreskin off. True story. And this guy was like, all right, you're a bit of a nutcase, I'll have you. And with this letter of recommendation from the Pope, he'd always insisted he was the son of deceased monarch King Suleiman of Habor. Now, unfortunately, Habor page does not exist. Habor sounds a lot like Tabor, and we notice over here, David Rubeni is born in Kabar, which we'll have a look at in two seconds. It says he was the minister of that kingdom's war department, now governed by his elder brother, King Joseph of Habor. According to Rubeni's own story, this kingdom had 300,000 Israelite subjects. The king of Portugal, impressed by the idea, had initially agreed to supply Rubeni with Portuguese arms, but after five months, Rubeni fell into ill repute with the king of Portugal, who perhaps distrusted his motives, and was asked by the king to leave his kingdom. His mission to Rome, he had envisioned a grand alliance between three Christian kings and one Jewish kingdom, King Charles V of Holy Roman Empire, the king of France, Prester John, the western alias given to the Emperor of Ethiopia, and the Jewish Kingdom of Kabar. What are the chances that Prester John is actually referring to the Prester John that would have been residing in Tenduk at this time? As we know, Prester John was handed down, because it doesn't mean Prince John, but it was a title handed down, and they were called princes because they were shams. Shams were princes, not the Grand Sham. These guys were below the Emperor and they would have been called princes or shams. So Prince John, a title handed down through this group of uh, Tenduk or Argon, is way more likely. Why would they be randomly teaming up with the Emperor of Ethiopia? It's, it's nonsense. But the Jewish kingdom of Kabar, which was then governed by Rubeni's brother. So I think it's quite clear that this was the man who came from Tabor. He's not the king himself, but he is the brother of the king, his brother being Joseph. Joining once more with Solomon Molko, he went to meet the Emperor Charles V. Rubeni offered Charles V the alliance of Jews of the East against the Ottoman Empire. So once again, why would the alliance of Jews of the East? In Rattersborn, Rubeni and Molko met Josel of Rosheim, who warned them against arousing the suspicions of the Emperor. Josel was worried about raising issues of the Jews in the Empire. When Rubeni and Molko persisted, officials put them in chains and took them to the emperor in Mantua. There, both Molko and Rubeni were examined by inquisitors. The former was condemned to burning at the stake in 1530. I, I like how the date jumps around, 1530, 31, 32, they don't know. But the former was condemned to burning at the stake in 1530, during the reign of Emperor Charles V, also known as Caesar Carlo, the Tsar. Rubeni was taken to Spain and assigned to the Inquisition at La Reina. As late as 1535, he was still confined in a prison there. Nothing more was heard of him. He probably died there, as Herculano reported that a Jew who came from India to Portugal was burned at an auto de fer at Avora in 1541. Another source said Rubeni died in La Reina, Spain after 1535. What's fun is it says Rubeni's diary is held by the Bodleian Library in Oxford. There was a possible a copy at the Jewish seminary at Breslau, but this place was destroyed by the Nazis in 1938. Guess what? 
Unfortunately, Haruveni, which is David Haruveni, Rubeni, Haruveni's diary was discovered in 1848 when it was purchased by the Bodleian Library in Oxford, only to be mislaid somehow in 1867. In the 1990s, a reference to Haruveni's file was found among the records of the Spanish Inquisition in Madrid, but the folder is missing. What are the chances? Now, this is the ancient ruined city of Kebar, where we're told that he supposedly came from, and you might notice a bit of an issue when we click onto this map. Unfortunately, it loves to not actually point to it when it's on this bit, but if you have a look at the map down here, you can see Kebar is right there, right here. Now, does that make much sense to you when you consider we were told it was in the Lop Desert over here? What do you think? You think it's going to be over here? When it says it's over here? Do you think the Jews of the East would be coming from the South? What do you think to that? And when we consider that Kabar is an oasis situated some 153 kilometers north of the city of Medina in the Medina province of Saudi Arabia, we know that this cannot be the same Kabar described. The maps were telling us it's in Tartaria. The other description told us it was in the Lop Desert, which would match Tartaria. Just remember, looking at this map, this is the Caspian Sea here and tables over here. Whoever's making this map would have had to confuse Tabor. This is the Caspian, so Tabor is somewhere over here. Makes sense, doesn't it? But they're saying Tabor would be, or Kabor would be down here. So that doesn't make sense. So let's have a look at some possible Tabors. And where does the name Tabor actually come from? Mount Tabor, or Har Tavor, is located in Lower Galilee, Israel, at the eastern end of the Jezreel Valley. It's the site of the Battle of Mount Tabor between the Israelite army and the army of the Canaanite commanded by Sisera. Mount Tabor is the place where Transfiguration of Jesus, a very important place, biblically, obviously, to the Christians and to the Jews. You can see why Tabor would be something that biblical people would want to bring with them, as shown by the fact that we have a Mount Tabor in West Yorkshire in England. So you can see West Yorkshire, England, we have a Mount Tabor right there, and obviously named after the biblical battle of Mount Tabor mentioned in the book of Judges. We also have a Tabor which is in South Bohemian region of the Czech Republic, and it has a flag with some colours that kind of do resemble our black and yellow flags of Tartary. But, other than the name, we can see the town was named after the biblical Mount Tabor. The town also gave its name to the Taborites, a radical wing of Hussites. It was initially called the fortified settlement of the Tabor Mountain. And it's located in the Tabor Uplands, which, again, don't have a page. And interestingly, having a Jordan Reservoir named after the biblical Jordan River. And just to give you an idea, that's where Tabor is, right in the centre of Europe, and quite far away from our Lop Desert, which was over here. We also have Tabori of the Taborinsky district in Sverlovsk Oblast in Russia. And this is Tabori in the Taborinsky region, and I tell you what, some of the land around here looks incredibly strange. So maybe somebody wants to jump on Google Earth and have a look around here, and tell me if you find anything cool in the comments down below, because you can clearly see places where the river used to flow in incredibly strange ways. Very strange indeed. And the last time I was here, I believe I found some ruins somewhere. There were some ruins around here. Looks a little bit inappropriate. Have a look around here for yourself. Maybe you'll find something interesting. This is Tabori. And in fact, I heard there was a mountain nearby named after a battle that took place here that they called the Battle of Tabor. And that's not to be confused with the 1420 Battle of Tabor, which took place in South Bohemian Czech Republic, which we talked about. The Holy Roman Empire, the Catholic Crusaders, Rosenberg forces, Austrian mercenaries against the Taborites. So it's very possible these Taborites are connected to the Tabor we're looking for, but I don't think they are the exact region we're after. Now, this page goes on to uh, basically call Haruveni a master of manipulation and somebody that would produce fraudulent copies of documents. So they're really attacking his character. So I don't know the truth behind that or why they would be doing that. But I think it's pretty clear that Haruveni, the brother of Joseph of Habor, the, you know, the son of King Solomon of Habor, this guy that they're calling King Habor, who was burnt at the stake in Mantua. I think it's all getting confused between this guy, Solomon Molko, because obviously Solomon was killed around 1530, 1530. 1532. This guy was supposedly killed in 1539 or 1540, which does match what the documents are saying, although it wasn't purposely at Mantua. 
Well, you see that David Rubeni here was an Arab adventurer born in 1490 in Central Arabia in Khyber, as he himself stated. He died in Lorena, Spain after 1535. So again, this is saying that it's Khyber or Khyber, the one in Arabia, which just doesn't make sense. So we'll actually come to this book called Jesus in India, uh, which is, believe it or not, a much older book than it looks. This is a reprint and it uh, talks about the possibility of Jesus going to India after the, after the crucifixion, which everyone seems to have a Jesus story. It's very possible because many of you might not know this, but Jesus sent out something like 72 of his disciples. He sent groups of two to go out and spread his word after he died. So we come here for one reason, and that's because here we have the narrative of a mission to Bokhara in the years 1843 to 1845. Pages 14 to 16, the Jews in Bukhara are 10,000 in number. The chief rabbi assured me that Bukhara is the Habor and Bulk the Halar of the second kings, but that in the reign of Genghis Khan, they lost all their written accounts. Now that makes sense because we heard that the holy books were lost in Tabor. So if this was Habor in Bukhara, Bukhara is the Habor and Bulk the Halar, then we just have to have a look at Bukhara, because we've heard about Bukhara a lot before, the Khanate of Bukhara, one of the last places in independent Tartary to fall, and we can see that the Khanate of Bukhara was an Uzbek state in Central Asia from 1501 to 1785. From 1533 to 1540, Bukhara briefly became its capital during the reign of Ubaidallah Khan. The Khanate reached its greatest extent and influence under its penultimate Abul Qarid ruler, the scholarly Abdullah Khan II. So, from 1533 to 1540 is the exact same period that David Rubeni was supposedly imprisoned in Europe before he was burnt at the stake. So is it possible that when he was taken and burnt at the stake that this guy that doesn't have a page, Obeidala Khan, became the ruler and made the capital Bukhara? And Bukhara, as we know, according to this document, is Habor, according to the chief rabbi. And where is Bukhara situated? We can see Bukhara right there, Uzbekistan. So the Uzbeks, another people targeted. Very strange, isn't it? How the people that get targeted are the exact people that we're looking for. So considering we were told that we were in the Lop Desert, the area where the Tabors came from was this Lop Desert. And this is Bukhara, which we are told is Habor. Is it much more likely that this is in fact the area of Tartary where he reigned from, where this Jewish king or prince perhaps, brother of the king, came to try and raise an alliance with the European Christians, with the Jews of the East? Not from Kabor down here, but from Habor up here, which is Bukhara, right next to the Lop Desert. So, I think it's way more likely that this is the place. These were our guys. And unfortunately, because of his diary being lost by the British 20 years after they bought it, we might never know the truth. So, I think I'll call that the end of today's episode. I hope you guys learnt a lot. And if you have any information about King Tabor or what might have exactly happened to these guys, then please do leave it down in the comments below and let me know what you think about this. Because... This is definitely something being hidden. The fact that his diary was misplaced by the British, and unfortunately, we won't ever know whether these stories about being Messiah claimants or prophesizers who correctly prophesized earthquakes and floods, whether any of it's true. We'll have no idea because they've destroyed the evidence or they've lost the evidence, so perhaps it'll turn up. Maybe we can be a little positive and maybe it's stuck at the back of a drawer somewhere. Or maybe it's been set on fire many years ago and we'll never see it again. Either way, something's definitely been hidden here. Is it the Roman Catholics trying to hide how brutal they were in burning other people's kings just for being Jewish? Or maybe it wasn't the fact they were Jewish. Maybe it's because they could see the future. Maybe they were working with magic to, to prophesize. And the, you know how the Catholics don't appreciate that. So maybe that's the real reason they were killed. Maybe they were considered dangerous who knows? You let me know exactly what you think down in the comments. And please leave a like and make sure you're subscribed if you enjoyed this video. And I'll catch you guys on the next episode of Ancient Historia.